Morning, everybody. It's uh, really very nice to be with you. Um, they say that the, uh, what characterizes the poor is a, a very risky environment, a uh, life full of uh, difficult decisions and you've got to manage uncertainty. Uh, I feel a bit like the poor uh, right now, um, in a sense that uh, uh, I thought I was going to be first up as the speaker, um, in, and that gave me something of a billing, like a warm-up band, if you like, to somebody like the Rolling Stones. You know, this is uh, Mick Jagger over here. Um, um, but I think it works okay. I, I, I think uh, it's very useful to, to get the, the technical details down. Um, I was also told by n nobody less than the Minister Neri himself, uh, no PowerPoints. <laughs> so there are no PowerPoints. Um, so if you like, if I'm a warm-up band, this is an unplugged type of a presentation. Um, let's see if we can do this together. Let's see if we can actually, we know how to actually dialogue with each other using words. Uh, let's give it a try. Um, so I live in South Africa, which is a country in which uh, there's been a very live and uh, participatory dialogue between the research community and the policy community in the post-apartheid period. So since 1994, it's a privilege to have been pulled in or, or consulted without overstating one's uh, influence, because I certainly have no particular influence. Uh, but the research community has been part of the policy dialogue process. And uh, so I'd like to just reflect a little bit on that and, and how uh, we've lived through an era in which there have been some fundamental changes in the way uh, money poverty is measured and these huge developments in the way multidimensional poverty is uh, being measured. And uh, that's had some impact on the way we think about uh, poverty in our country and we think about policies to alleviate uh, poverty and, and hopefully that's a useful input for, for us to think about. So we'll use the South African canvas to draw out some lessons, some, some issues in our approach to these issues. Uh, and in some senses this is just an encouragement to all of you uh, to put your case studies on the table. This is, after all, an interactive dialogue, and I think that's absolutely crucial. We've got a wonderful mix here of practitioners and experts, and, and so that's what we're all about. So, uh, in South Africa is, is a middle-income country. So that's one of the key interesting inputs into, into our dialogue here. Um, even in 1994, the start of the post-apartheid period, the start of our democratic era, uh, the, the one dollar a day poverty line was about a fifth of any uh, sort of acceptable, vaguely acceptable, national poverty line that was being discussed at the time. Obviously, uh, New South Africa, and we're thinking about strategies to alleviate poverty, and there's a discussion about do we need a poverty line to marshal the war on poverty? Uh, and it's, it's worth noting that middle-income countries it puts you in a very very awkward space in, in a discussion around ending poverty because if you go with a dollar a day, we've done really well. But in 1994, in the new South Africa, our sense was we were just starting a process of social upliftment and transformation and we wanted to embed our poverty alleviation in, in that sort of context. And so there is this issue then about uh, the dangers or the perils of, of specifying uh, money poverty lines uh, and excluding, th thereby making some countries comfortable that this discussion is not about them. And uh, I think that's quite important. 
to, to address that. Fortunately, in South Africa, we didn't really need the, the mandate of, of an international pressure to, to help us deal with our poverty. Um, and so, uh, from the outset, we started a, a classically South African social dialogue. But what's interesting about the South African case study is, uh, from the outset, because we were looking at broader transformation, it was never a discussion of just money. There was an awareness, because of our history, that, um, th that th there were things that perpetuated poverty and perpetuated inequality in our country. And so the policy discussion was always a broader discussion that included uh, money, uh, things that uh, the labor market, employment, social grants, but also realized that there were some really crucial dimensions, uh, education, health, etc. And even at that time, 1994, the international climate was such that uh, we had the UN producing uh, indices that included education, health, and income. So there was an environment that, that didn't exclude those things, and then we were in a social context where we just insisted um, that that was included. There are some risks to that space, because if everything is up for grabs, it depends a little bit on, uh, is there anybody in government who can actually coordinate and, and shape this debate and actually emerge out of this complicated discussion of education, health, water, housing, uh, and income uh, into some sort of policies that have some sort of focus? It's a tricky issue. I think uh, it's something we should be wary of in the multidimensional measurement issue uh, without an accompanying discussion of policy. Uh, in South Africa, I think we, we've done okay because we've always had some sort of coordination in the planning process. Although we've never had a national poverty line, we've never had a ministry directly uh, charged with coordinating the alleviation of poverty. Um, there's been some policy guidance from, say, within the presidency, within the treasury, that's responsible for shaping the overall coordination of policy, so it can, can bring these multidimensional discussions to some focus or another. Um, and I think that's really important. And um, over time in the country, that's, that's changed a little bit, but we've always had some organ of the state that's responsible for taking care of that. If you don't, I think it's very easy for the, the poverty perspective to get lost in the hurly-burly of, of the politics and people fighting for budgets and, uh, you know, even important budgets like the education budget or the health budget or, or water. Um, uh, you know, the, sometimes multidimensional poverty can, can be confuse, a confusing milieu. One of the points I'd like to put on the table from the South African uh, example, flowing out of the fact that we've always had these balls in the air, is then that there's, there's a lot of action, if you like, within the income space and within the multidimensional poverty space over the last 20 years. That, uh, that's, quite, that's been quite useful. Let me just draw your attention to to some of the, the developments in our country within both of those spaces. So, in the income space, there's been a very active and, and a debate about this national poverty line that has refused to go away. Because, in some sense, it's obvious that uh, even if you can't do a dollar a day or two dollars a day or three dollars, if those are socially unacceptable, you do need to focus the eyes of the country on something. And so there's always these calls for a, a national poverty line to focus the debate. But if, if those lines are too low, then what is the right poverty line? This is a really int intractable and really tough type of issue. 
And in South Africa, it's, a, it's very much a social issue. It's not a technical issue. At the end of the day, I think the consensus in South Africa is that the technical basis for deriving poverty lines is pretty arbitrary. Leaves you in the lurch at the end of the day. So it's a social dialogue about poverty lines. And so uh, one of the pieces of the state that's been responsible for shaping our policy towards alleviating poverty and inequality is called um, the, uh, where we had a, a commission, and the National Development Commission to derive a national development plan. So around this national development plan, it's, it's recent, the last few years in our country, there has been this discussion. And so, um, if, if the dollar a day line was around 130 rands in South Africa, just per person, per month, just keep rand, rands probably mean nothing to you, but keep the 130 in your head. A proposal was made, a sensible, reasonable enough proposal, that a low poverty line should be 515 rands. Okay, so that's five times the dollar a day. There was outrage, absolute outrage. That's an insult to the dignity of South Africans. That's way too low. Uh, lots of warnings about the danger of specifying a poverty line is that then you endorse it in some extent. Is that an acceptable standard of living for South Africans? Given that the social old age pension in South Africa was paying uh, 1,200 rand at that stage to propose a national poverty line of 515 was just not acceptable. So even a higher poverty line, a higher line of 900 plus rands was deemed unacceptable. And so the National Development Plan stepped away yet again about the fifth attempt from a poverty line in the country. Um, and, but at the same time, uh, was very interesting in pushing that perhaps we needed some sort of aspirational line in the country to, that we should reach for, uh, that again, we couldn't, we couldn't get to a, a, a clear money measure. So the suggestion was made, well, let's go and ask people what they think they need to live on and, uh, and this rigorous process has been done, it's underway right now. The figure that's coming out in the country is, a, is about 4,000 rand that people say they need to live on per person per month. Uh, that's very high. It's not high in terms of the dignity of South Africans, but think about it. So we've got a, a one dollar a day at, at 100 something rand, some technical poverty lines at about 500 rand, a subjective line at 4,000 rand. And it's a very fraught political space to do anything about that. Um, At the same time, wrapped into these debates about a national poverty line is a real awareness that there must be some connection between the poverty line and a national minimum wage, a living wage, uh, all of these sorts of things. Uh, maybe the, some sort of um, uh, targeting rule for policy, like you, you don't get a social grant if you earn more than a certain amount. So it's not without implications. So we haven't solved this in South Africa. We're even in the money space, uh, but we are very aware of the importance of money, of income, in and understanding the processes that drive income. South Africa has a huge unemployment problem, and we need uh, to create jobs for people. We also have a huge problem with people earning low wages. And these are very tough issues. These are the drivers, in a sense, in a sustainable sense, of, of poverty and inequality. So the money dimension and the role of social grants in alleviating poverty uh, have played a very, very important role in the policy dialogue. So certainly I'm arguing that even if the, the poverty line remains elusive, the serious interrogation of the money side of poverty 
is very, very important. What about the uh, multidimensional poverty space in the country? Well, here South Africa's got such an interesting story to tell. In, uh, let's reflect on some of the developments that have happened in this multidimensional poverty space in our country. Uh, obviously, the Millennium Development Goals are an important sort of intervention into that space. And initially, I think South Africans were very comfortable with the MDGs because, as I said, we, you know, the dollar a day, the poverty lines that were in play make us look really good. Uh, there was a sting in the tail. Most of the MDGs are very comfortable zones for South Africa. But life expectancy with AIDS, uh, with HIV AIDS in the country, really burnt us. Our life expectancy plummeted from the late 80s through the 90s. So by the time the MDGs kick in, we've got a terrible life expectancy. And that's awkward. And I'm affirming, I guess I'm using this to affirm the fact that, uh, that it is useful to have these uh, indicators and the multidimensionality because countries are very uneven and we've all got work to do. And, uh, and the response of the government was quite interesting too because the initial uh, reaction was, well, a bit like the multidimensional poverty thing. If we're doing okay on seven out of eight, we're doing fine. That, you know, but the failure to want to grapple with the, with the life expectancy issue was, was useful because it, it, there was an, um, the shoe wasn't fitting entirely, so there was some pressure on the government. But take us to the present, and we've calculated, changes have been made, James Foster's done pioneering work. We've got these multidimensional poverty uh, indicators. We've calculated them in South Africa. We've got many uh, changes in, in poverty from 1994 to the present show some reduction in poverty at, at any poverty line. You can do quite robust analysis, some reduction, but entirely due to the social grants, entirely due, in a sense, to, to government's intervention. It's a triumph, in a sense, but it's a concern because there's a sustainability issue. What's happened to multidimensional poverty? We've done extremely well over the post-apartheid period. Uh, I'll just give you some numbers just to give you a sense again of the changes. So when we calculated using exactly the international um, categories that James put up, the education, health and the others, the living standards, um, we had a multidimensional poverty index of 0.37, what's well, a head count? It's not the index, it's the head count. 0 0.37 in 1993 and 0 0.08 in the present. That's, that reflects a very successful government uh, uh, interventions into education, improving years of schooling quite dramatically, into health, uh, with, with primary health care, um, housing, electricity, water. That's a good story. It's a dramatic change. On the money metric count, as I said, we've had a slight fall, a clear fall in poverty, but not a very spectacular one. If we use the same metric, so the 0.37 that we were as a headcount on multidimensional in 93, we, make, we set a poverty line that has, a money poverty line that has 0.37 of the population uh, poor, by the present, we've got 0.28, so we've got 28% of the population poor. A much less spectacular fall than the multidimensional poverty. And so it's an interesting space where we've done well on the multidimensional, but not well on the income. Uh, in, in the multidimensional space, there there's an interesting political economy. I'm not sure it's present in the room, but economists versus the rest. I don't know, does that happen in your world? Economists versus the rest. Sometimes when I walk into a, uh, a, a policy forum, I feel like uh, Darth Vader or something. You know, I'm the economist, and uh, I'm here to say, uh, 
money or your life expectancy is going to shorten dramatically. Um, uh, but this audience, I'm sure, I'm sure we're all much more comfortable with each other. And, and one of the wonderful things, I think, about the work on multidimensional poverty is, is that it's, uh, uh, there's a role for economists, but there's a role for everybody in the, in the work, and the, it's serious work on the poverty issue. So it's helped to break down uh, the barriers a little bit. But sometimes I get, uh, the multidimensional approach can still catch me as an economist. So I'll be proposing the classic um, James Foster categories, education, health, this is about human capital, this is about my world, I'm very comfortable. Um, and then I'll leave out something that somebody regards as important. And they're clever. And they'll say, you know, um, the gender dimension is really crucial, but you're weighting it to zero. You know, uh, why are you doing that? Um, and, and so, they, you know, in the multidimensional thing, there is this national debate about, okay, which dimensions are you putting on the table? Uh, and in the South African context, to link up uh, the multidimensional approach to income, a crucial issue that's emerged is the issue of quality. The quality of the education services, the quality of the health, in a sense, the return on the investment that you're getting in these multidimensional spaces. Uh, we have a real concern about education. It looks as though we've achieved great things in years of schooling. We've moved averages of schooling from seven years to 10 years over just over 15 years. That's an amazing achievement. But in the labor market, it doesn't seem to be helping people get jobs. It, we've got real concerns over whether we're really achieving anything with these increased years of schooling. And I think the quality issues are an important part of the discussion. So let me quickly make some comments in about the synergies between the two dimensions, because that's, uh, that's a really a key point I want to put on the table here. So it's not economists versus the rest, I hope. Um, and the MDGs and uh, multidimensional indicators aren't irrelevant for even for middle income countries. I hope I've been clear about that. <clears throat> but I think that the interactions between the income space and uh, the, multi the other aspects of multidimensional uh, poverty do require serious interrogation. Uh, sometimes measurement can, can obfuscate that point. Um, in some senses, income fits in a slightly different um, space. If you think about the capabilities approach and the capability space, in some senses, income fits, could be conceptualized to fit a bit later than education and health. If you think about education and health as foundational, in an inequality of opportunities type of a sense, uh, this is a right. This is what people need to be citizens in a country. And uh, the, maybe the income comes later. But then the interaction between the two, making sure that your investments do give your citizens a job, the, the right to be productive in the society, becomes really uh, important. So this focus, I think one of the key linkages between those two dimensions is this con a notion of returns. Are we getting a return to the various dimensions? A social return, a full return, I'm open to citizenship, um, so, for example, in South Africa, social grants are really, really interesting. We've got a massive social grants program. It's been a, a, an amazing achievement to keep macro balances intact while rolling out the social floor. Very successful. We're very proud of it. But the, all the evidence suggests it's not generating second round effects. It's alleviating poverty, but it's not helping people start small businesses. It's, um, it's, not, uh, it's helping a little bit for people to do job search but it's not actually uh, generating the type of uh, pathway to escape out of poverty. That, I, I don't think that's the attraction of the social grant. I think it's a statement that you need to embed your discussion of poverty, uh, multidimensional poverty especially, in some sort of analysis of the interrelationship between these various dimensions. Uh, it's not about measurement and it's really, really hard and we're not there yet. I don't think. Um, 
we, we need, because at the end of the day, anti-poverty policy needs to harmonize these various efforts in ways that, that do generate maximum externalities from the different dimensions that you're dealing with. I think that's very, very important. Uh, okay, so wrapping up now. I started out by saying that I was sort of an uh, opening act to the Rolling Stones. Uh, hopefully I'm not Neil Young, who, who opened up a song by saying, uh, this song starts out slow and then it fades away altogether. Um, so anyway, I hope I haven't done that to you. Um, but I've told you some stories and let me wrap up a few things. So South Africa since 1994, when we ushered in our democratic era, um, we had this ethic, an imperative to alleviate uh, poverty and embedded it in our policies and in a mandate of broader societal transformation. So that's very uh, op uh, the right framework for multidimensional poverty approach, I think. Um, there's then been a very active dialogue over the monetary poverty line and the other dimensions. Um, and to this day, we don't have a monetary poverty line or a sole ministry tasked with poverty alleviation. Um, fortunately, I think our social dialogue hasn't stalled because of all of this uncertainty, but I'm arguing that be because these di issues are difficult, the interactions between the different dimensions are very difficult, and I'm not sure we've maximized the impact of our multidimensional approach. I think we didn't stall it but we could do way better. We're a middle income country. I've argued that even so, uh, being embedded in a context like uh, a campaign to end poverty and uh, a focus to improve the lot of the bottom end of your distri income distribution uh, and hold governments to account is really, really important, even for middle-income countries. I don't want us to be excluded from discussions about ending poverty by uh, picking the wrong poverty line, for example. So at the end of the day, all of this has to translate, though, into commitments, policies, and action plans at the national level and within countries. You can have an international framework that's got to come back into the countries. There's still a lot of work to be done, especially, I think, in the light of the, the wonderful technical work that's helped us to put things in place. We, we have a multidimensional poverty index now in South Africa. We didn't before. Uh, but there's still a lot of work in the policy space to make that work for us. So it's about configuring policy and addressing in the South African context absolute and relative poverty. I think this requires respectful partnerships. It's, it's hard work. There's no flip solutions. It requires serious work from the policy side to be prepared to engage with people uh, who actually do understand how education works, how it feeds into the labor market, how health works, etc. So that's a South African thing, and we still are in the space, a very privileged space, where those sorts of interactions go on. And there is a, a space to have that dialogue. I think the seminar is a space like that. And so I'm very, you know, pleased to be able to conclude that we need to work very hard together, roll up our sleeves uh, in the context of a seminar like this. Thank you.